See, take a 30 second sidebar. We've been told that it's all about taxes and it's all about health care and it's all about finances. <laughs> not if you're in the kingdom, it's not. People say, well, do you watch the, the debates? Oh, I watch a little bit of it. But the reality is, whether I pay $2 for a gallon of gas or $4 for a gallon of gas, it's not going to change the blessing of God on the United States of America. Whether my tax rate is 15% or 35%, it doesn't change the blessing of God on America. Are there things that changes the blessing of God on America? You betcha. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. But see, we as Christians got to stop looking at this stuff like the world looks at things. You can't look at marriage. You can't look at parenting. You can't look at anything like the world looks at things. You have to look at it the way that God declares to us through a kingdom perspective. Would I like to pay 15% instead of 35% in taxes? Woohoo! Yes, yes, indeed. Would I like to pay $2 a gallon of gas instead of $4? Woo, yep. Sign me up, baby. I absolutely would love those things. Does that change the blessing of God on our nation? Nope, not one iota. So we ask ourselves going in this, what's my focus? Is it the things of this world? Are there comforts? Because we can look at different things and different policies and different procedures that are going to take place. You know what? I like this better. I agree with this better. Um, and just to kind of put it all out there, you're never going to agree with one person 100%. There's going to be areas of disagreement. But God says that there's kingdom perspective. Before we dive into that, let, let's just look real quick and, and let me share a few things with you um, as we go through this. We, we talked about this, what God says to us, isn't this only in the Old Testament? Uh, let, let's look, by the way, let me just say on behalf of Ananias and Sapphira, if, if God uh, only did this in the Old Testament, he owes an apology to Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> the bad news is that was the book of Acts when they were struck down. You know, it was an Old Testament. That's... Uh, Lie, say that again, <laughs> lie to the Holy Spirit and poosh, you're, you're gone, baby. And then he writes to John and he says these things to him. Let's talk, let's see what he says in the book of Revelation. By the way, last chapter or last book in the, the New Testament to the, the church of Ephesus. He says this, look, he says, you don't love me and you've lost your love for others. I'm just paraphrasing to cut it down for sake of time. He says this, um, basically what happened is Ephesus was, um, they were going through the motions. If you just go through the motions and all, it's all about religion, he says this, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. That means he is going to remove your light and the blessing of God from your life. Holy buckets. Lord, that's got to be Old Testament. I will remove my lampstand. I will remove your lampstand from its place. The ch church of Pergamum, he says this. They were compromising with idolatry and sexual sin. He said this to them. I will come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Holy moly. I will come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. To the church of Thyatira. They not only compromised with idolatry and sin, but they taught others to compromise. It says this. I will come and throw you into great tribulation. The church of Sardis, they were once again dead on the inside. He says, I will come like a thief, and you will not even know what hour that I will come against you. God, what is all this coming against your people stuff? I don't like this. Let's go turn back to the grace parts. Church of Laodicea, he said, look, if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. So, well, Pastor, isn't there a nicer word than spit? Well, I can. The honest word there is vomit. vomit. Is, uh, if, if you want the, the real, uh, I'll give you the King Jimmy there. Um, I know, NIV sounds a little better. Spit. Now, and while I'm laughing about this, do you understand the seriousness of what God is saying? I will vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to come steal from you like a thief that you're not even going to know I'm coming. I'm going to remove the blessing from you. I am going to war against you myself with the words of my mouth, and I'm going to throw you into tribulation and terror. Wow. That's not a, that's not a soft message. That's not a, a light message. And he says that to churches that are operating after the sacrifice of Jesus. These are shared, and, and I understand Church, and if you're watching this via the internet, I, I understand. These are not easy things to hear. 
And quite frankly, can I be honest with you? That's why most preachers don't preach on them. We, we do Revelation 3.20 about God standing at the door of our heart because that's the great part of where God comes back in with His mercy and grace. But we skip over, quite frankly, we skip over the beginning parts because we know that it's not a comfortable subject. But if I'm going to give you the fullness of the Word of God, I can't skip over this just to make it sound good in your ears. Now, Let's give a little bit of good news with it, okay? Because in the same sentence, the next page, Revelation 3, 19 through 22, says this. Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. Now, get, get that in your hearts because the grace teaching that's out there right now will tell you that God doesn't uh, discipline His people. Um, yes, He does. You see this over and over again. Don't, in fact, the Bible tells us don't despise the chastening of the Lord. It's, can, I, can I share this with you? Going to the woodshed is a wonderful experience sometimes. We, we all, I don't know how many of you grew up with um, belts or stick. I, you know, my family grew up with a wooden spoon. You know, that's, uh, they make a mean little whoosh. You know, it's, uh, and plus they were just big enough for my mother to right over here to carry it in her purse wherever she went. <laughs> and you know, it is amazing just pulling the wooden spoon out of a purse, how it corrects your behavior immediately. <laughs> I see, you know, I walk through Walmart and I see moms screaming and yelling at kids and almost battling and getting into arguments. We never had that in my family. My mom carried her purse. She brought out that wooden spoon just a little bit, lifted above the lid. We knew full well what that meant. Uh, the behavior stopped immediately. That's uh, still in Africa. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there was no yelling, screaming. There was, uh, understand, boy, shape up now. Or we're going to change the shape of your behind when you get home. That's, uh, and that was just part of growing up. And some of those things are wonderful things that uh, helps you learn and grow. But it goes on and says this, so be zealous and repent. In other words, discipline and reproof are meant to bring you to repentance. They're not meant to make you feel bad, not meant to make you stick in a room, but it's so that we can draw closer to God. Why? Because behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. I'll eat with him and he with me. See, if you bring the entirety of the scripture together, it's actually so much richer than if you just take a part of it because you're understanding, look, even after you've messed everything up and God says, look, I'm going to discipline you and, and I'm going to bring this upon you, but I'm doing this so that you can repent. I'm doing this so you'll actually come back to me and live with me and I'm going to come in and I'm going to live with you and I'm going to stay with you. We are going to be together forever for eternity. See, that's good news. When uh, we're bringing up my children when they were little, after a, a time of, uh, of discipline, I would always sit with them and uh, um, especially one of my children, I won't give which one, is I always say to her, well, I used her. That's right, I got two hers. You're still guessing. You know, that's... Uh... Sorry, sweetheart. I would always say to her, I said, do you want Daddy to go out now? And she said, would say, no, would you stay with me? And we would stay and snuggle. And the, we would end up being closer after the discipline than even before. Because see, before, what are we doing? We're, we're dealing with our own attitudes and anger and we're pushing back and pushing away. After we submit to discipline, we're soft and pliable and ready to, to be reconnected again. You know what? God's a, a, a heavenly father. His desire is not to punish you. Desire is not to, to stick you in a closet somewhere. His desire is to bring you close, that you would live with him forever. Um, we shared this, line, this next line down al already. Always remember, God relates to us through covenant. Grace and blessing are what we receive when we operate in His covenants, is that next line. Now, let's talk about those blessings for, for just a moment. Um, Deuteronomy 28.2 says this, All the blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 7, 9, understand therefore that the Lord your God is God indeed. He is a faithful God who keeps his covenant for one generation, for thousand generations, and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him 
and obey his commands. Deuteronomy 30, 19, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessing and cursing. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Can you hear the heart of God desiring you to come in and to make the right choices? He's saying, look, if you live with me and you, you love me and you follow after me, you won't even have to run after blessings. It's not really about blessings. It's about my presence. If you live with me, blessings are going to overtake you. You won't even have to seek after him. You're going to live a life of blessing because you live in my presence. The presence of Almighty God is the number one thing to seek after in all our lives. And so we recognize that God's presence, his, his desire, how much he desires to be in our life. Every decision, here's the next line down, every life decision must be in light of God's word. Everything we do is in light of God's word. Why? Because we're bringing the presence of God into every part of our lives. We bring it into, like we said before, our parenting, our marriages, all, all the rest of it. Our greatest desire is to bring God's blessing into our lives our families, and our nation. Most politicians end speeches with the words, and may God bless America. And we feel secure in that thought because we are Americans, and we feel like God owes us his blessing. Wow. Do you know that Jesus dealt with this in his day? Do you know that the Sadducees and Pharisees felt that they were owed God's blessing? Because of where they were born. In fact, Scripture says this, John 8, 31 at the beginning. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And they answered him, that's the Sadducees. They answered and said, but we're Abraham's descendants. In other words, look, we've been born in the right place. We're living in the right place. Don't you know who we are? We're, we're entitled to God's blessing. No, you're not entitled to God's blessing because where you were born who your parents or grandparents were, you're entitled to God's blessing because you follow the word of the living God. Because we bring God's word into our lives in every decision we make.